Hello everyone, um, this is Alan Ferguson and I'm moderating today's presentation. Uh, you're in the right place and uh, we'll start the presentation in about a minute. Uh, so. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Safer Workplaces Today and Beyond, Aligning Industrial Hygiene, Risk Management, and Occupational Health, presented by Process Map and Ramble. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor at Safety and Health Magazine. I'm moderating today's presentation. On behalf of the National Safety Council, we hope that you, your loved ones, and all the people in your lives are remaining safe and healthy wherever they are. We'll start this presentation in a couple minutes, but first, there are some housekeeping items. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council of the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll cut out a question and answer session with our speakers. To ask a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type your question, and click the send button. Please feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we might not get to every question. The good news is that any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsors. After this presentation, you'll also be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and I'll tell you more about that a little later. Just to let you know, this webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com events. With that, let's introduce our speakers. With us today are Rob Rodersman and Gregory Monzo. Rob Rodersman has more than two decades of experience in industrial hygiene and uh, with an emphasis on evaluating risks from chemical, biological, and noise exposures in workplaces. That experience has ranged across a wide variety of sectors, oil and gas, construction, hospitals and healthcare, industrial manufacturing, pharmaceutical, education facilities, laboratories and commercial and residential buildings. Rob has managed hundreds of industrial hygiene products which have included the development of exposure risk assessment procedures, design and implementation of sampling protocols, review of ventilation systems, and design and evaluation of exposure controls. He is certified in the comprehensive, comprehensive practice of industrial hygiene by the American Board of Industrial Hygiene. Greg Monzo has more than 20 years of experience in environmental health and safety leadership at the facility and business unit levels in several global organizations. He is Process Map subject matter expert on industrial hygiene solutions. Before his current role as executive vice president, Greg was a director of health and safety at American Standard. He was also an EHS leader for Baxter Healthcare's Latin American, European, and Asian Pacific or Asian Pacific operations. Again, we thank you all for tuning in this presentation. Rob, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Excellent, thank you for the introduction. If we can just skip, uh, we can actually skip to the next slide, thank you. What we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna, we're gonna get into a little history of industrial hygiene, what it was, how we did things actually not too long ago in the past, what it's evolved into, um, and, and how we're managing all the information we're getting when it comes to performing risk assessments, um, implementing the risk assessments, and, and what to do with the data from uh, risk evaluations to, for chemical or biological exposures to, to, to workers or employees in the workplace. If you go on the, the next slide, please. Actually, you can skip forward to the next one after that, too. That's just an intro slide. Thanks. Um, Ramble, a little bit about ourselves. We're, we're a fairly large consultancy uh, engineering firm, but we do have a very strong, we call them our health sciences practice area. And within the health sciences, we have a group of toxicologists, epidemiologists, industrial hygienists, and we can, more broadly speaking, exposure scientists. Again, we do consulting. My background is primarily industrial hygiene, although I do have a degree in, in epidemiology. We can go to the next slide. So enough about us, and we're going to talk about 
primarily exposure assessments. When we look at industrial hygiene, we all, we all know this, right? It's the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of chemical, biological, physical um, hazards in the workplace or community. Where we're gonna to talk today and where we're gonna live in this presentation primarily is the evaluate, uh, number two there. And one of the reasons I bring this up is you really can't separate health risk evaluation with exposure assessment. A health risk is the exposure, how much you're exposed to, times the toxicity of the product you're being exposed to. You go back to Paracelsus, everything is toxic, it all depends on the dose. Well, the exposure in our context is that dose. So we really cannot pull apart health risk assessment um, and exposure assessment. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about I'm going to talk about pretty much how to do the exposure assessment, why to do the exposure assessment, then Greg's going to get into how to manage the information that you get from the exposure assessment, which is really becoming a, a big thing in industrial hygiene and in a growing practice. Next slide, please. This is a table that in, in general has been borrowed from the American Industrial Hygiene um, Exposure Assessment Strategies book. Um, we, we talk when we design our exposure assessments to figure out what our workers are being exposed to and, and evaluate that health risk that we talked about previously. We, we, we start by information gathering, right? We, we, we go out there, we define uh, similar exposure groups, which I'm gonna be talking about later on, which is, which is critically important. Once we get the information, we perform our risk assessment. Our risk assessment is gonna include possibly a qualitative risk assessment, which is, developing a risk matrix based on judgments, based on information, and prioritizing where our quantitative risk assessment should be. And our quantitative risk assessment, and that, that, that's the old school industrial hygiene sampling, right? So for the purpose of today's talk, when we think about qualitative risk assessment, or we refer to it sometimes as QLRA, that's the judgment piece. That's going in and gathering the information and making a judgment on where our risks are. Quantitative risk assessment is actually the data gathering. We're collecting samples. Once we completed both the qualitative and the quantitative risk assessment, we, we, we in a position to make a judgment, right? Is the exposure to our employees acceptable? Do all the definitions that we define as acceptable, were those met? Are they safe, right? Um, there's gonna be times when the outcome is we're uncertain, where the, the, the data is muddy, it's in that gray area, right? We, we really are not sure of whether or not we're comfortable with the levels that employees are being exposed to from a risk standpoint, uh, in which case we need further evaluation of, of, of the situation. And then we have um, unacceptable. So when we go through our whole risk assessment process, we potentially will come up with situations where we have deemed the exposure or the health risk to our employees to be unacceptable, in which case we, we move into the industrial hygiene phase of controls, right? And there's actually been one more um, added on here that, that, that's not in this flow diagram is we wanna confirm. Right? We, we, we don't have this, that arrow in there, but no matter what we're doing, whether it be you know, if we have an unacceptable exposure and we've identified a control, we now want to confirm that the control we put in place has in fact controlled the exposure that we initially found to be unacceptable. Um, go to the next slide, please. We talk about, in, again, we're looking back a little bit about industrial hygiene then and now. Um, you know, I, I know I, I've been around doing industrial hygiene for about 25 years. And, and I still recall the days, again, not too long ago, I don't feel like I'm that old. But when my first job was, decisions were made at the plant level. It was, it was a very large uh, manufacturing company, uh, very large. And we had our, our, our one facility and it was, it was myself as a junior industrial hygienist. We had the occupational nurse and we had the industrial hygienist. And, and we made decisions at that site for what we would sample for. We would um, keep our results in a log book one of my first tasks was to take that log book and, and go through and you know use a calculator and figure out average exposures for some people. But it was, I wouldn't say it was primitive because we got good information, but it wasn't necessarily coordinated. Um, we just knew we had oil mist and we knew we had machines. And if you have oil mist and machines, you sample for that. And we did it every year, regardless of what the data showed. That's just what we did. Um, now we have more team input into decisions. Um, there's, there's more, like I'll talk about later on, there's more stakeholders. Uh, that provide their input, whether it be from a corporate level or other entities that are interested in what we're doing and why we're doing it, and quite frankly, what our risks are. Um, we've gone through those from those log books, and now we're looking a lot at data that's managed more electronically, right? Um, we, we now have the ability to look at data across a corporation or a plant and, and get those descriptive statistics, which, which Greg's going to talk about later on. 
Um, now I sit there and punch numbers in my calculator to get an average. We, we can now go and calculate standard deviations and all kinds of other stuff with our, with our data. And it's also maintained often from a centralized location. So there could be corporate uh, review of the data or reviewing data from other plants even uh, to, to see trends and what's going on. Uh, as I mentioned before, our stakeholders have gotten more complicated, um, which made our team more complicated. I mentioned that we have maybe health providers, human resources, the industrial hygienists, often unions were involved early on uh, when I first started. Now we are looking at stockholders for a company might be interested. You know, our, our firm does a lot of due diligence work and environmental due diligence until quite recently often did not include industrial hygiene exposure assessments. But those who are now evaluating companies potentially for transfer or purchase want to know what their risks are for employees being exposed in these facilities. So industrial hygiene and exposure risk has really can affect the bottom line and, and, and the value of a business, which is a new stakeholder in, in the game. Um, we have the media, PR. We, we, we see it occasionally now where there'll be something going on where an exposure takes place in, in a workplace and people unfortunately become ill and, and it makes you know, the news. And it, it actually could be positive or most, more often than not negative uh, reflection of the business. We have more attorneys involved now. Uh, early on, an attorney might sign off on something or look at things. It seems to me every conference call that we have right now regarding a risk assessment includes at least one attorney on the phone. Um, that's because the, the, the stakes have been raised, right? Um, we also have customers. We, we have supply chain management. We have product safety and stewardship, um, fields that have been evolving. And um, customers are worried about what they're buying and, and what's the, uh, the safety and risk to the employees of, of, of the companies they're purchasing from. So if we can go to the next slide. And going back to sampling, right? This is part of our exposure uh, assessment. This has also changed dramatically. And it also has a big influence on how we're making decisions and evaluating data. Um, first air sampling pump was developed in the 1950s, right? As, as it put in old bicycle lamp housing. Um, even after we had the first air sampling pump, we only could analyze for a few chemicals. I, I was on a project recently where I remember looking back and there, there were field written notes uh, from an industrial hygiene report, all handwritten, about how they had just come up with uh, charcoal sorbent tubes and they can now analyze for VOCs using an air pump. And that was in the, in the late 1970s when the first validated method. So for a long time, we didn't really have very sophisticated techniques to collect data or collect information. And when we did, um, you know, we got the going out there sometimes with an impinger, you're, you're, you're bubbling air through a reagent, you're sent into a lab to see what color, color change or what you captured in, in, in a liquid media. Taking those samples was challenging. You know, you, you put a lot of effort into just taking a few samples and getting a few data points. So you think about it, you might have this logbook early on that contained very few data points just because collecting samples was difficult. And a lot of the chemicals that were out there, we didn't even know how to analyze for them. So again, it was a lot of the judgment. Now we've moved up to diffusion badges, right? And, and that doesn't seem like a big step, but it is because now it's not this exercise of having a bubbled burette on your desk trying and a stopwatch trying to calibrate. This is something that most people can, can do. Most people can do the sampling. They can open the cassette, they can clip it on a collar, close the cassette and send it to a lab. So the collection of data has become a lot easier, which means we have a lot more data points. And if we can go to the next slide, please. We also have the advent of, of, of direct reading instruments. Um, you know, earlier on, we would uh, measure over an eight-hour shift, and, and we still do, and that's still very important. But when we got the direct reading inf instruments, when those first came out, we could then start focusing on specific tasks or specific uh, job function or duties or, or operating procedures that would contribute most to employee exposure. So now we're getting short-term uh, direct read data points that we're mingling with our longer-term traditionally eight hour samples. Uh, started off detection tubes. I, I had to put this picture of the bellows pump in there. I think those of us that work with those for years got those, those Popeye forearms, right? Where you're squeezing this pump for over and over 10 reps, 50 reps, depending on how you know you're wanting your limited detection. And, and these bellows pumps are, are still being used, quite frankly. They're, they're still good and they still have a lot, a lot more chemicals than some of the, the sensors out there. But we do have, a, I think in the last five years, just an explosion of the type of sensors that are out there, the chemicals we can sample for, and the ability to data log, which means now we're setting something up where it's taking a, a reading or a measurement you know, every few seconds possibly over the course of a, a work shift and providing a graph of exposure over time. So now we have a lot more data. We're going from that 
time period where we would take one or two samples, it was a fairly difficult process, send them to a lab and get one or two data points for a whole work shift, where now we just have a sensor, we clip on a bunch of employees, we, we download the data and we have just graphs and, and, and a lot of information that we can actually correlate back to the work that they were doing and then control specific point sources of exposure or identify what's contributing most to the exposure. And what that is, is that comes into big data, which might be the future of industrial hygiene um, and how to manage that data. Um, next slide, please. So we know how to sample, right? We know we have these sensors. We, we want to figure out who to sample, what to sample, where to sample, and when to sample. Um, you know, I think a lot of companies still struggle with this. It's, it's getting your industrial hygiene plan together and figuring out where to deploy these resources and how to deploy them most efficiently. So that way you're, you're not spending a lot of time chasing exposures that are, are not a substantial health risk and, and then missing the ones that are, right? So again, there's a few stages. We have our information gathering stage. And then one of the stages I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about is the defining similar exposure groups. And this really isn't a new concept, but it's still one that's difficult to get right. And it's very important. So when we talk about similar exposure groups, um, as AIHA defines it, it's groups of workers having the same or general exposure profile for the agents being studied because the similarity and frequency of tasks they perform and the materials and processes with which they work and the similarity of the ways they perform tasks, which is a fancy way of saying these people are all doing the same stuff generally. So therefore, we expect their exposures to be similar. And then what we can do is take samples from that group, you can call it a, a SEG or an SEG, we can take samples from that SEG, and then we can potentially make inferences to all the workers within that population, right? So that way, we're not trying to sample every single employee, we're defining those groups and taking representative samples from those groups. Um, the next step is to identifying potential expo exposures or agents that those SEGs would be exposed to. I mean, obviously you're gonna have a person that's maybe operating a forklift in a warehouse, might have a completely different, be in a completely different SCG and or SEG and, and have completely different exposures than somebody that's operating the production line, right? So we're gonna have different exposures to different people based on which SCG they are in. Then what's important, and I think to do this in, in advance is we need to define what is acceptable, what is uncertain and what is unacceptable outcomes of, from this assessment. If you remember that flow diagram earlier, it all really comes down to this. And if you haven't defined things in advance, you potentially run into controversy later on when you're trying to interpret data. For some companies, acceptable might be 10% of the lowest OEL, something very conservative, and no sample ever exceeding 10% of the lowest occupational exposure limit. Some companies might be less conservative and just say, are we regulatory compliant? Are we meeting with OSHA? Uh, OSHA's PELs or OSHA's regulations. So whatever your company decides to do, just define it in advance. That way there's no debate or confusion later on when we're making these, these, these decisions. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? A quick poll. Um, it's curious who on the call is cur currently uses some type of qualitative risk assessment. I'm not talking about sampling. I'm talking about QLRAs, the, the, the judgments of determining risk in advance of sampling. I am unable to see the results um, on my screen, but if uh, someone could, oh, there they are. Oh, interesting. So we, it, looks, it looks like we have uh, close to half of, of the people who are uh, participating do have a qualitative risk assessment in place. Um, about 37% uh, do not and 16% don't and the, or don't or they're not sure. And hopefully in the, in the next uh, few slides, we're going to try to define what qualitative risk assessments are for those that don't know what they are. Hopefully they'll know at the end of this. For those that uh, don't have it, maybe we provide some ideas on how they can implement it. And for those that do have it, you know, feel free to chime in in the Q and A session, or maybe you know, an idea or concept we're putting out there can help help uh, help you learn from that. And I think what Greg's going to talk about is then managing the, the outcomes for this. But just a couple slides on what a qualitative risk assessment is. If we can go to the the next one, please. 
A qualitative risk assessment is basically, a, it's a risk matrix. It is determining whether or not, based on your judgment and your information gathering, whether or not you believe an exposure is going to be low risk, de minimis risk, or high risk. Um, we typically use the, what goes into that matrix is often a health ranking, um, an exposure ranking. So again, this goes back to our health risk analysis is exposure times toxicity, right? So our health risk ranking, our health ranking is a toxicity and our exposure ranking is how much they're exposed to. And then we develop a final risk ranking. If we can go into the next slide, please. This is an example of a health ranking. I'm, I'm providing these as general examples. It, it really needs to be determined based on each organization and do your own research on what categories you want things to fit in. This is just something I pulled together, uh, pulled it from an, an older report that we did a, a long time ago, um, where a company you know, decided what made sense for them. Um, so in, in this example, we're, we're looking at, let's say an occupational exposure limit is greater than a thousand, right? So our health risk ranking is one. We're looking at that as probably not being very toxic. Uh, we also have for particulate, maybe 10 or greater milligrams per cubic meter. Again, it's your health risk ranking is one. Um, on the scale of five, if you have a, a, a PEL or an OEL that's, that's less than one, or the particulate level is less than 0 0.05 milligrams per cubic meter, this company determined that would be a five. That means we're, we're really worried about exposure to this chemical. So again, we're gonna put this into a matrix later on and, and, and develop and build off of this. Um, but we need to start with something. We need to start uh, defining what is our high and low risk. And other companies might use a scale of one to 10 on this, uh, right? Maybe one to 20 if they wanna break it down and get more nuanced and, and, and more granular in the assessment, which for potentially a chemical manufacturer might make a lot of sense. Um, we also have some things we're adding on. There's acute toxicity. If it's carcinogen, maybe we add one or two to it. But bottom line is we're coming out with a, with a ranking, whether it be one to five, one to 10, based on toxicity, which is the health risk ranking. If we can go to the next slide. Now we want to look at exposure ranking. So just because something's really, really toxic, if they're really not exposed to it, it's not really that much of a risk. Conversely, if something is not really all that toxic, but they're exposed to it all the time at high levels, potentially high levels, then that might be a risk. So we need to look at exposure uh, within, within our risk matrix. And what we see here at the top left of this is um, our, our ultimate end ranking for exposure. But what goes into it? We have the frequency of exposure. How long are they exposed? Is it less than 15 minutes when they are? Is it one to two hours? Less than one time a month, uh, daily? Um, so if you look at the top right, you get your frequency uh, score or your ranking. And then dispersion, how likely is this stuff to actually be in the air? If, you know, we have the article exemption in OSHA, but, you know, very unlikely. You know, so, something's a solid material, probably is not going to become airborne. You might have dermal contact, but from, a, from an airborne risk, it's probably not going to have that much dispersion. It's not going to be airborne, so it can potentially be a low risk. Uh, conversely, if you have a very, um, a very high vapor pressure, it, you know, becomes airborne very easily or very fine particulate, it could be a, a high risk from the dispersion ranking. And then we also want to think about you know, how is this being controlled? Is this a closed system? Are you feeding something right off of a tanker truck directly into a, a you know, some type of storage vessel through pipes where it's, it's fairly enclosed? Or is this something that's wide open and dispersing readily into the air? So in this case, and again, this is just an example, we're taking frequency, dispersion, and we're taking control. We're multiplying those together. And again, going to the top left, we're getting our final exposure ranking. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And then we take the risk ranking, we take the exposure ranking, we, we put them together, one to five, one to five, and then we have our final ranking for each. And this would be for each chemical and each similar exposure. Uh, very high down to de minimis. And obviously the very high ones are gonna be concerned, the de minimis, de minimis ones will, will, will probably not be uh, higher on our radar to prioritize into sampling. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we do with the data once we have the qualitative risk assessment? Um, we figure out, first of all, what are we going to target? Um, we, we say how, how many samples we're to collect, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. Um, an example is we might include all moderate to very high um, determinations from our qualitative risk ranking might move into sampling, right? Um, we might want to take representative low risk rankings, maybe I don't know, 10, 20% of those, 
and sample a few of those just to validate our judgments, to make sure that when we're saying something is low, it is low. And if we start seeing a bunch of these low exposure, what we judge to be low, coming back as moderate or high when you take the samples, then maybe we need to rethink about how we define things and how, how we did our process. We need to determine, is will statistical analysis be performed? Um, how, how are we to determine the number of samples we're to collect? And again, I, I'm gonna revisit something that I said earlier. We need to define in advance, or compared to the criteria that we did define in advance, what fits in the category is acceptable, uncertain, or unacceptable. Um, so our quantitative sampling just goes back and verifies or validates our qualitative sampling. And our decisions are actually gonna be made from our quantitative sampling because that's the actual data where the qualitative risk assessment was based on judgments. We may in fact go back and adjust our qualitative risk assessment based on the findings from our sample. Uh, next slide, please. I just talked about a lot about how, how this program looks, I guess, from a, a management perspective, right? What a qualitative risk assessment is, um, how to generally get your samples together, the, the fact that we're going to be collecting a lot more data. We're going to have a lot more data points. But one of the things in, in my short time being able to, to speak here, a lot of the concepts I pulled from today and really just did a very quick, I know, and I apologize, talking fast uh, summary was most of it comes from this book, uh, a strategy for assessing and managing occupational exposures uh, published by the American Industrial Hygiene Association. For those that are not familiar with this book, but want to start um, a qualitative risk assessment program that tails into a quantitative um, assessment program, I, I highly recommend it. Again, this is a couple hundred page book and I just did a you know, five, six slides trying to summarize. So I, I didn't do it any justice at all. Um, next slide, please. So what's next, right? We talked about getting these risk matrix together. We talked about defining your similar exposure groups, whether your toxicity, your health risk rating is one to five and one to 10 or whatever it might be. Is it high, medium, or low? Your exposure ranking one to 10, one to five, whatever, high, medium, or low. We, we've developed this whole final score of each one. And we're doing that for every exposure, for every similar exposure group. We put on top of that, the fact that and one thing we didn't really talk about was we need to define what data we're collecting whenever we get up, wherever we're collecting a sample, data standardization. Are we also collecting information about what product they're working with when the sample was collected? Were overhead doors in the factory open or closed? Did the line go down during sampling? Was there a process upset condition? We're putting that now on top of all the uh, information we have for the, for the risk matrix, for the SEG, for each exposure and agent. We've gotten a long way from our logbook that's sitting in the industrial hygienist desks and, and the calculator that I used to use to try and figure out averages. We've now moved into a, into a situation where we actually have a lot of information, a lot of data, and we have to figure out a way to manage that data. As an industrial hygienist, I'm good at going out there and, and doing the risk assessments. I'm not necessarily the person to put together the type of system that can help us manage that data. So I'm gonna turn it over to Greg and hopefully what Greg will do is build off the concepts and, and show how we can, how we can manage that, uh, that program. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. I appreciate the opportunity here. So uh, next slide, Kathy. So perfect. So just give me about a minute to do a quick introduction to process map and kind of set up a little bit here of why we're gonna be talking about software applications. So process map was founded in 2000. And basically back then, uh, there weren't many third-party EHS software companies that were out there. So when we came to market, basically we actually started with a chemical management solution. The idea was to help companies manage their chemical risks. And so that was one of the very first solutions that we, we founded uh, that was included as part of our founding at process map. Um, we've grown throughout the years. Uh, we've added a lot of different solutions to our portfolio. I'll kind of highlight that in a, a little bit, a little bit later. Um, and more importantly, as we grew, we realized we had to expand internationally. So even though we were founded in the United States, the reality is multinational corporations operate all over the world. So you needed to make sure that um, the solutions that we had would, would support um, a multinational world. So ultimately ensuring that our, our, our product was available in a variety of different languages was something that was critical to uh, making sure that we had a good global reach. 
We were the first EHS software company that was offered in a cloud-based environment. When we were founded back in 2000, the idea of having all of your environmental health and safety activities managed on the cloud was extremely foreign to many companies. Everybody thought that it was important to have everything on their servers. So it was more common still at that particular time, if you were gonna buy software, you were going to management, manage it on your servers, with your data centers, with your technology team, and do all of that. There was, there was this point in 2000 after the Y2K that they were starting to move in a direction that why can't things just be managed in the cloud? So ultimately we decided that that was gonna be our business model. Now, the reality is, as, as I mentioned, when we started and we looked at ourselves as more mostly a chemical management solution, we realized that there's a lot more to EHS. Next slide. That brings us to this, which is basically who we are today. We recognize that there is a large variety of risk out there that we have to try to support. So whether that risk is going to focus on what we're gonna talk about today, which is indust managing industrial hygiene through qualitative and as well as quantitative risk management solutions. But the reality is uh, when you're dealing with environmental health and safety, it, it will expand outside of traditional brick and mortar. You may have service industries, you may have transportation, so you've got to look at a lot of different areas and, and there's going to be a lot of different data that, that, that people are looking to gather. So it's important to be able to support that particular process, whether it's information directly on incident management, audit related activity, sampling data, occupational health um, uh, risks uh, and, and encounters. There's a lot of different um, expectations that companies now have in making sure that you're properly managing your EHS programs. Next slide. Our focal point is primarily going to be around industrial hygiene today. But the reality is industrial hygiene does touch a lot of different areas of safety. So one thing about process map, we do have a lot of different solutions and we are seeing more and more of our customers try to relate industrial hygiene to a lot of different other activities, such as um, the way that they might uh, manage their incident activities, audit related activities, uh, documenting their, their company policies. So there's a, there's, whenever a customer is looking to take industrial hygiene solutions, ultimately they start to realize that there's other information that's really required to support those programs. Now we're not gonna focus on those today. We're gonna just strictly focus on the industrial hygiene piece, but it is something I will, will say, it's, it's very fascinating to see how when a company will come to us first for just focusing on industrial hygiene, they realize that they need a lot of other supporting pieces to really make sure they get the ultimate success out of managing their risk. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about where companies, uh, where they are in the way that they manage their software. Um, what's rather interesting, when, when I joined Process Map back in uh, 2006, there wasn't really any particular market around industrial hygiene, okay? At that particular time, 15 years ago, a lot of emphasis was still basically in about four core key areas. Number one, people were looking for a way to consistently manage their incidents. Number two, people were going out and they were doing audits. They wanted a better way to analyze their audit data. Number three, companies were out there generating environmental health and safety sustainability reports. They needed ways to gather that information from their facilities so that way they could roll it up and push that information out possibly on an annual sustainability report or some kind of um, annual operating report for the corporation. So the, the reality was industrial hygiene wasn't really thought of too much from a, a, a multinational perspective. It was really a lot of focus was on how it was being managed at the individual locations. For that reason, Excel spreadsheets was the most common thing that we come across when we talk to customers. So we asked them what they were doing to manage their industrial hygiene risks. A lot of them say, well, we have everything on an Excel file. Well, ultimately that Excel file is going to be limited to the location. And when I'm talking about location, I'm talking about the terminal, the computer that that information is. Because even back then, we didn't have today what we have with Google Sheets where we can collaborate on these Excel files across um, different visualization. It was stuck on somebody's hard drive, okay? What happened was that then people wanted to get it off of people's hard drives. So what did they think about doing? They went ahead and started pushing towards some kind of document management system. 
one of the most common things that many corporations adopted was Microsoft SharePoint. So it came with your Microsoft Office products. So ultimately you could bring SharePoint, you could put those files up there. So at least gave people access to the data, but it didn't give them anything that they could do with the data. So it was still very static. If you wanted to take it into an Excel spreadsheet, out of an Excel spreadsheet, you were then usually dumping it into another Excel spreadsheet. So that way you would just do more analysis. But you still didn't have the holistic visibility of what was going on. And more importantly, you didn't really have any of the preliminary underlying data or information that supported the data. So you just had sample results, but not necessarily all the other activities that helped understand why you had those results. So ultimately, web-based software applications started becoming more uh, prevalent to manage industrial hygiene. We started to see a lot more activity, I would say around 2012, 2013, all of a sudden people started asking more about industrial hygiene. But the interesting thing was, as a company, we made the decision, because we were seeing that the risk was there, we actually brought our industrial hygiene module to the marketplace back in 2006. And I'll be very transparent, we did not see a lot of interest in the very beginning. So ultimately, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, more, uh, about that evolutionary pace, phase and how, when we brought this industrial hygiene solution to market, how ultimately the expectations of what our customers had around that, um, how we had to evolve that product. So let's go to the next slide. I think this is our first poll question, or excuse me, second poll question related to data. So what, what we're curious to know is, if you are managing industrial hygiene data, how are you still doing it? Are you still using Excel spreadsheets? Have you brought in some type of uh, supporting application? Did you build something in-house? Um, are you using anything off the shelf? Or at this point, is nothing being utilized? So I'll give everybody about another 15, 20 seconds to respond to the poll. All right, here we go. So as we can see uh, from a majority of the respondents, Excel is still a pretty commonly used process. So when you factor that in with spreadsheets and basic applications, um, we're looking at a little bit more than two, almost two thirds. So 62% so of respondents are still using some of the more uh, traditional basic um, tools to be able to manage their industrial hygiene solutions. Perfect. That's great information. Okay, next slide. All right. So this is this is something that I like to share, which is Verdantix is a an independent organization that goes out and reviews all these different third party off the shelf environmental health and safety software solutions. They were founded back in 2005, and they've really done a nice job of helping all of us in the software space show the value that we can bring to organizations. They've also been on the forefront in the way that they've looked at different uh, software products and the type of solutions that those companies offer. What's rather interesting, when, when Verdantic started out as a company, they were looking at the more traditional holistic stuff that I talked about incident management, audits, task activity compliance, as well as environmental health and safety and sustainability data management. But in 2017, they decided to go ahead and do a survey specifically on industrial hygiene related solutions. It did include occupational health and ergonomics. What happened was they looked at the different software companies to see what kind of investments have those companies like Process Map made towards these particular applications. So they had come up with a baseline standard of what the expectations were on what the software could do. So they went around and they interviewed a bunch of different companies, got ideas of what they were looking for in regards to uh, the value that, that industrial hygiene software can bring. And they came up with a standardized set of questions. So when they did this first poll, what's interesting is that based off of the, the scoring parameters, that they provided, 
they looked at about 20 different software companies. And the average score at that particular time was only 39.8. So there wasn't a big emphasis on uh, making sure that, they we, that, that these companies had strong, robust industrial hygiene. But once that was released, they started to see a trend, which was companies started looking to bring industrial hygiene management into its portfolio in a way that they manage data. So ultimately then, they went back and they did a survey again in 2019. And they could see that company, once again, the software companies had made significant investment in the software and the score increased by more than 25%, went from 39 to 49. They did the same thing in 2021. And needless to say, once again, they saw the score increase. So more and more companies are making more investments in the industrial hygiene software because the demand is there. Okay, next slide. Now, how pro process map, what's rather interesting is this is kind of a little bit of a journey of our customers, not so much us, because at the end of the day, software company, good, great software companies build based off the of demand of their customers. That's something that we've adopted as an organization. So when we brought our industrial hygiene software solution to the marketplace, we had different ideas of what we wanted it to do. But at the end of the day, we wanted to work with our customers, make sure that we provided something that would be a value add for them. The biggest focal point that we saw from 2006 to 2012 was uh, around just visibility. People were frustrated that they'd have, they would be based in the US, they'd have operations in Latin America, they'd have operations in the Far East, they'd have operations in Europe. Heck, even if based in the, in, in the US, you, you'd be based in New York and have operations in California. Getting visibility to that data was a massive challenge. So ultimately, they wanted a way to get that data into a web-based application. They wanted to see what the results were, okay? As they started getting, as, the, as there was more focus on the visibility of the results, then people started realizing you needed better ways to get the data in. So rather than manually keying this information in, if you're going to be sending your samples off to the lab, why not get the data directly back from the lab? So that made things a lot easier for the end user because then, Instead of them keying in all the information on what was the 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 um, uh, what was the overall sample met the measured sample result, what was the lab concentration, what was the detection limit, all of that information came back directly from the lab. So it made things a lot easier. Once they got that data, then why not be able to generate the employee notification letters? So you have it, you have the results, automate the the letters. That's what we first started with. Then the next five years, we started seeing more analysis on the way that uh, customers wanted to do to use data analytics tools. So they got all this data. So it goes back to one of the things that Rob talked about, which was now you've got all this data. How can you validate the exposures around a similar exposure group? So does the data help you establish similar exposure groups in the organizations? So our customers wanted better ways to be able to analyze that data to be able to validate those similar exposure groups, okay? There was also a lot more emphasis on, on getting the data out of the system rather easily. So ultimately getting that data out through business intelligence tools, be able to then do greater analysis, whether it be locally, other different ways, presenting it to leadership so that way they can get more support on CapEx and other different initiatives they wanted to take, that was a priority. And then finally, uh, setting up sampling strategies. Once you now had the data, you could figure out how much more sampling you needed to do. So finally, 2017 is when we really started to see our customers say, hey, we don't want to just sample anymore. We want to have processes to help validate if there is a significant enough risk to help justify why we're sampling. So more emphasis was placed around budgets in industrial hygiene. So rather than spending thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars on sampling, let's first determine if we have a risk. A lot of companies were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in sampling to get results that were non-detect, or let's say below 10% of the action, 10% uh, of the limit. So they wanted more flexibility in the way that they could manage their, qual their, their data and, and their activities through a qualitative risk assessment process. And then once they had done those risk assessments, use the risk assessment to help establish your sampling strategies. So that was the paradigm shift that we saw a lot in the way that we did things. Next slide. So what's rather fascinating now, when you look at the way that our solution now functions 
it's more aligned where if you look at the, the previous slide, how we went from where we, we ended at QRAs, now that's more of the focal point. So the people are looking at doing QRAs, looking to do sampling plans, and then ultimately having that data from the sampling plan to be able to do the sampling. Next slide. What's really interesting that I can tell you as part of being a, with a software company, even though there are some standards out there, there's really no regulatory enforcement. So ultimately, what happens is, is, is companies want flexibility in the way that they use their qualitative risk assessment process. So one of the things that we see is there's a, a lot of different variables that will go into it. And not only that, but the nomenclature is so... Uh, can pretty can be pretty different customer by customer. In some cases, some companies will only focus on, let's say, three variables. Other companies might focus on four. One of the things that you saw in Rob's model was, for instance, dispersion might be something that, they, that a company might utilize. But when you're looking at it from a software perspective, they may not leverage that particular example. So we, we see expectations around being able to modify formulas, we have some people that want to be able to do multiplication, some people that want to be able to do addition. So there's no standard in the way that the calculations are performed either. Next slide. So when you look at how we have to set up the product itself, you can see these are three different examples from customers where you can see in the very top one, somebody is looking to do dispersion, exposure, and certainty. Someone else is looking to leverage um, uh, uh, time and frequency. And then when you get down at the bottom, another one might be in other different areas, which you can see um, they're only using four different categories to be able to do the calculations. Now, the one thing I just want to share that's rather interesting is when we first rolled this out, a lot of emphasis from our customers was around the idea of getting this high risk value than to be able to go out and do a lot of sampling. But one of the things that we're starting to see change over the last 18 months is companies are looking more at the uncertainty level. How certain are they on the risks or, or how the, the chemical is being used? So if there's, if there's a lot of certainty, it tends to lower the, list, the risk value. But if there's uncertainty, it's pushing the risk value. So we're seeing that an uncertainty factor is starting to play more into this process and deriving the risks versus actual sample results. In the beginning, a lot of times people were looking at the legacy sample results. What did the baseline data tell us? And based on that information, then they would sample more. But instead, it might be situations that they know it's a high risk sample, but they're also certain on it. So they sample less because they know the employees are going to be exposed. So we don't need to keep validating that the employee is going to be exposed. Instead of taking six samples, we're only taking two samples. But instead, when they have a lot more uncertainty, they're starting to take more samples to determine if they have different similar exposure groups. Next slide. So ultimately then, when you get all this qualitative risk assessment data, customers can also now use this and put it out as part of a support of any kind of controls that they may have, such as a, you know, utilizing it as part of maybe a risk assessment document for a particular job or a particular work area. Next slide. More importantly, when you start to look at the analysis of the data, this is a very good example here where what's happening is customers can now look at all the different job categories across the organization and find which job categories maybe have the higher risk. So then they can start working on bringing best practices that focus on how to reduce risks for these specific jobs. Next slide. And finally, then you can start to get more of a holistic understanding of your data. This is where you can also now start to leverage some of your sampling results. So as part of having your qualitative risk sample results, you can do a compare and contrast of the actual sample results. So hopefully you should start to see some alignment that if you have high risk qualitative risk assessments, when you take the samples, in those particular work areas or whatever ends up representing a similar exposure group of that qualitative risk assessment, you should be able to see if the sample data validates some of that. The nice thing that we try to do with our product is make it a living, breathing document. So that way, if the results show something different, you can go back in and modify the element of the 
qualitative risk assessment, get a new score, and then derive a new sample plan. I think we just have one more slide. And then that's the way the last piece comes into play, which is that once you've now done your sampling that supports your qualitative risk assessment process, if you'd now also like to, to leverage the data to be able to pull real-time descriptive statistics and so forth, you'll be able to do that. So then you can once again do some validation against your qualitative risk assessment process. I believe that is my last slide. Okay, so for the most part, I think everyone understands strategy, methodology, and processes, plus a digital solution. Our goal is to try and come up with a more uh, innovative, healthy workspace. We are seeing that more and more industrial hygiene equipment, uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, sampling organic vapors, our goal is to eventually start to pull the data directly from those types of uh, equipment devices, noise dosimeters, uh, sound level meters, and so forth. That way, that data all can reside in the platform so you can utilize it as part of building out your uh, industrial hygiene sampling strategies. Next slide. And there we go. Well, thank you oh, both yes. for this fantastic, insightful presentation. And before we start the q and I want to remind everyone about the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. This survey will open in a different screen after the webinar. Your input is important because it'll help us improve our future webcast. Okay, now let's get to some questions. Um, our first question, with SEGs, must all conditions be the same to use those results? Uh, I'll, I'll take a quick, uh, quick stab at this one. Um, no, you, you, you don't need to have all conditions the same across an SEG to, for, 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 to, to use the data. Um, you're not going to get that. It's just not going to happen. What we need to do is we need to document conditions when the samples were collected. That way, when we see the, the variations in the data, something being very low or very high, we can then tie it back to the conditions that may have caused it to be low or high. And if it is high, maybe we can adjust the condition to lower it, right? Um, but I, I think it's uh, getting everything to be the same every time uh, across an SEG to sample is, is challenging as probably it's not going to happen, quite frankly. Our, our next question, um, and I believe this is for Greg, uh, what size company number employees would benefit from EHS management software? And is there anything targeted to employers with less than uh, or fewer than 100 employees? Gregory there? I apologize, I was on mute. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so so with 100 employees, I will admit that that is a little bit of a tougher justification. One of the main reasons why is because of the volume of, of um, whether it's sampling activity or qualitative risk assessments that are being done at that particular site. Don't know if you're going to get enough data that really is gonna to, to, to determine through a software application um, the you, you know, if, if you're getting the best return on investment, I'll say most of our customers that are using the industrial hygiene software, usually it's when you start to get to, to about a thousand employees, because at that point you could start to really determine, are you under sampling? Are you over sampling? The other thing too, is one of the real values of software is to try and also do benchmarking across your different facilities. So single site operations, a lot of times may not get the greatest value because they can't see what some other different facilities are doing. So one thing about the qualitative risk assessment process, you could potentially validate and compare what you, what happens at your process if you have sister operations and see what the results are at their particular locations to, to be able to determine, are, are you at a similar risk level? So when you're starting to look at software, usually there's more value and return on investment when you start to get at, a, a I would say a thousand employees and maybe about a handful of locations. There was a, uh, speaking of small I, um, IH data sets, there was a question about, are there any tools built in for Bayesian statistical analysis? So there are, so there are um, tools out there for Bayesian statistics. From our standpoint right now, we focus on the traditional descriptive and parameter, par, uh, 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 sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Our focal point is more on the traditional statistics that AIHA or I should say IHCE focuses on. Um, at this particular time, many of our customers, if they want Bayesian statistics, 
um, what happens is there is a product out there that you could just take your sample results because you're only talking about taking one or two samples. Uh, you could just take the sample result and you could license that particular product, put your sample result in there and get the Bayesian statistics. Again, we didn't bother bringing in the Bayesian statistics for that exact reason. We're trying to look at a lot of data. Bayesian statistics is trying to look at very little data. Kind of is a little bit counter to what we're trying to showcase. Uh, Rob, I think this is a follow-up to the, the previous question I asked you. Um, uh, in asking about similar exposure group SEG, uh, should you sample under the same environmental conditions? So again, I, I think uh, same sampling on the same environmental conditions each time. I, I think they need to vary. You need to figure out. You know, sometimes it might be seasonal changes, right? You you might have overhead doors open during the summer. You might have uh, them closed during the winter. So you want to take that into account and maybe sample under both conditions uh, to see if there's a difference. Um, we also sometimes would take the approach of sampling reasonable worst case, right? You, sometimes that could be, depending on how you're looking at the data and doing the analysis, if you look at your SEG and you find out, you determine which people or which job task within that SEG is probably going to have the highest exposure and under which environmental conditions and pull your samples from that, that's a common way of doing it because if your reasonable worst case is controlled, then you can look back and make inferences that other situations for that SEG would also be controlled. Like another question to you, Rob. As, as OSHA is only minimal protective regulations, should, should um, we use more stringent standards set by ACGIH or an REL? I, I think the short answer is that's a management decision based on risk tolerance of the organization. I think that's my, my canned answer, but my, my, I guess my more realistic answer is, I think it's widely recognized that OSHA um, occupational exposure limits or PELs are, are outdated and may not be protective of health. So I would look at using OSHA as being um, a regulatory risk assessment. Are you complying with regulations as opposed to a health-based risk assessment? If we're truly looking to protect worker health, we probably wanna to look to ACGIH, we may wanna to look to the TANIOSH or AIHA wheels or something along those lines. Or what some organizations do is they, they take OSHA and they divide it by half or 10%, say we will never exceed 10% of an OSHA standard. Um, that is something, as I mentioned before, should be defined in advance in your industrial hygiene program you know, before you put anything else together because you don't want to have the controversy of what's acceptable or unacceptable based on that come up later on. So you got to figure out your risk tolerance uh, for your exposures and then select which one is best for your organization. But OSHA and, is, and yeah, a little bit higher. Yeah, and Rob, I'll, I'll kind of add to that because one of the things that's been unique about my situation is that, you know, we, we have customers in, 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 you know, that are using a solution over 50 different countries. And it's really fascinating because we think just about OSHA regs, but I'll, I'll give a very simple example. You just take something as basic as acetone. You know, in the United States, acetone, the regulation is around 2,400 milligrams per cubic, uh, per, per, uh, cubic meter. ACGH has it at half of that, at 1,200, but you'll go to some countries and it could even be below that. A great example is in Australia, I think it's around 800. And in China, they go as low as 300. And that's for a traditional eight hour time weighted average. So what I just always kind of recommend to people is just be consistent. If you're going to do your qualitative risk assessment based off of regulatory, um, ultimately you may leverage, because it's only going to be one piece of it, right? You may have to leverage the regulatory limit, the, the local regulatory limit. If not, then if, if you want to stay consistent, a lot of times using ACJH, because it kind of standardized things across the board, doesn't matter which country, that's, that would just be the one statement that I would make is just be consistent. You're going regulatory, do regulatory if you're going to be ACJ, try and do that. And that's what we see our customers do as well. Uh, question for you, Greg. Uh, can you tie in uh, SDSs into this, the systems? Yes. As a matter of fact, our chemical management solution is directly integrated with our industrial hygiene product. Uh, Rob, out of uh, the similar exposure group, what percentage of employees do you recommend sampling? I don't think there's a, there, there's a number just we can throw out to say, this is how many people you sample. Yeah. I, I think first of all, it depends on the risk. For the higher risk exposure groups, you're obviously gonna sample a higher percentage of people. 
Uh, for the lower risk, you might be satisfied with sampling only a few people just to validate your initial judgment. We also sometimes want to look at the data. If we see a large standard deviation in the data, like we, we have some really low exposures, then we have some exposures that are getting pretty high, then we want to probably sample more because the spread in the data is there and we, 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 need, we need to resolve that uncertainty. If the data is very consistent and there's not much uncertainty in the data, then you probably need to sample less. Um, I wouldn't give it an exact percent uh, for each one because I think each one's different, but that's something that definitely should be considered and is part of the industrial hygiene plan. Yeah, and even to add to that, Rob, you know, from, from our standpoint, a lot of times our customers apply a multiplier. So a great example, if something comes in low risk, what happens is they usually have a standard baseline, like they expect to do six samples over, let's say, a three-year period. So their baseline would be, let's say, two samples per year. But in some cases, if they, they have the, the risk shows that, that it's extremely low, they may actually adjust that sampling down and take maybe just three samples over a, a, a three-year period. And, and, and the other way around, which is it's high risk or let's say high uncertainty, they may take more samples. So we see our customers apply a multiplier where they can almost double up the number of samples that they may do over a traditional three-year sampling cycle. All right, thank you everyone. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but once again, unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsors. And again, we also hope you take the time to share your feedback through our survey. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Rob Broderman, Gregory Monzo, our sponsors, Process Map and Rambol, and of course, everyone who joined us today. Take care and be safe.